Okay, Sounds so I guess the title says what we're going to do, except we point out it's actually split into two parts, starting with me. Uh, second half is and uh, a bit of background, some pictures of where we are, University of Nottingham uh, on the Jubilee campus, which is not the primary campus, but a smaller one on the side. Uh, nice picture of our library, the inverted cigarette type uh, thing. And we're actually in the computational optimization learning lab which you can see the icon on the right hand side, Coal Lab, and we're part of that lab, which, as you may expect, does optimization and learning from a computational perspective. <clears throat> and that covers what we do. Next. So. And I thought one way to introduce it might be potential context, not the only one, but might easily find someone who says, oh, my problem's NP hard, so I'm using a genetic algorithm. Um, and that happens quite a bit when we talk to people. And it also gives us some kind of a context because my first half is really about short tour of complexity, helping understand what does that bit NP hard actually mean? And then Ender's side is some alternatives to genetic algorithms. And I guess part of our point is that genetic algorithms are very good, but there are other options available now. <coughs> OK, so then it pass over to me, so I'll start sharing my side. There you go. Get my laser pointer up. OK, so this is going to be fairly fast tour of complexity theory for optimization. It's really designed to be able to show uh, some aspects of um, background theory that is helpful, we believe. And so carrying on. So motivation, you often see statements like, oh, such and such a problem is NP hard or NP complete. And believe it's important to know what those actually mean at some intuitive level. Not going to do deep theory, but just sort of what's going on so that avoid misuse of them when coming to write up papers or anything about this. So the, my part of the talk is going to have three sections. The third section I probably won't get to. First bit, quick run through definitions, P, NP, NP hard, NP complete, what they mean. Some uh, often people use the wrong meaning for them. And then some discussion of something called the no free lunch theorem that also include because it's often misused. And we see that quite a bit in uh, papers and or dissertations. So I thought it's worth adding something about it. Third party, if there's time, is parallel world. We're used to doing sort of sequential things, but with ever more cores, multi-core machines, parallel becomes ever more important. And there are complexity results that are relevant to that. So first of all, P, N, P, N, P, hard. P and N, P. There's a theory of it, probably seeing references to it quite a bit. It often goes with something along the lines of I've got to do meta heuristics or inexact methods because the problem's NP complete. And aiming today to give some intuitive idea of what that actually really means, because people often get that uh, not quite right. <clears throat> Bit of context, first of all, if you break down observations of uh, how algorithms perform in terms of runtime, there's usually sort of three rough groups that you see. There's logarithmic algorithms running something like log of n time or log of n all squared time. This is typical for databases in practice. What this means is you can do millions to billions, the typical Google 
can search for a billion web pages in less than a second. <clears throat> so that's very fast when you got that, it's great. Next step up, polynomial algorithms, where it's n or n squared or n cubed, typically not much larger than that. And this happens quite a bit. You see it with SatNav, shortest path problems in the SatNav, and they're still polynomial algorithms, famous Dijkstra's algorithm. It's not, it's much slower than logarithmic, but it's still quite fast. And what this means in practice is you can do thousands to millions. Unfortunately, what we often hit are problems where the runtime is exponential, two to some multiple of n, <coughs> but some when the multiple a uh, bigger than zero. And this in practice means you can then limit it to doing hundreds to tens of thousands, maybe if you're really lucky and if you do it right. But when you hit exponential, as we do in optimization problems a lot of the time, then things slow down. And you're stuck with being able to solve much more of the problems. And so everything is fighting this exponential behavior. Uh, there's a little note here that just because the problem's exponential time doesn't actually mean that they're all of the same kind. There are different kinds of exponential time problems. <clears throat> so what happened in the 70s was basically people worked on many, many practical problems. Some were found to be efficient, i.e. you could find an algorithm with low order power law n in squared or something like that. Examples of sorting, shortest path, network flow, lots of work on this in operational research area. And then there were other problems that seemed to be extremely inefficient. Try as you hard as they could, they couldn't find any algorithm that was better than exponential runtime to get an exact answer. And so there was this class that emerged and it was a bit frustrating because it all seemed a bit ad hoc. You get a problem, you try really hard. The best you can manage is exponential. Is that just because you're not you're missing something or is something else going on? That means you're really not missing something and it really is. That's the best you're likely to do. And the theory of P and NP was developed precisely to capture this split and formalize it and be able to write theorems about it. So what this ends up as is that we have a class P, which I'll get to briefly, fast, efficient, and then there's this NP, or actually more specifically MP complete, where try as we might, we haven't found good efficient ways to do it. And way to think about P and NP is that it's just a classification system. This is really just like you know a dog is a mammal, an ant is an insect, and or, uh, metals are different from gases in chemistry. It's just a classification system. The catch, of course, very famous uh, problem with P versus NP, is we have this classification system. P and NP, we don't actually know if it's a real one. So it could be that the two classes, P and NP, are actually the same. It's believed they're not, generally speaking, but they could be. And it's so important to the theory people and so really, really annoying to them that there's a million dollar prize for solving it. And of course, fame and fortune and very difficult, challenging problem. Obviously, I'm not going to go into the theory of how might we solve that problem, but the practical point of this is that there is the theory does tend to say what kind of methods you should use on problems. So it, it's not just theory, it does have practical impact. Uh, picking your algorithms, you don't want to pick the wrong class of algorithms. So starting easy class P, this is pretty much what you would expect. You'd say a problem is in P in this class. If there's a polytime algorithm for it, if and only if there's a polytime algorithm for it. And polytime algorithm means it's n to the k for some particular fixed k. 
trivial example sorting is n squared. Even the bad initial first attempt at a sorting algorithm such as bubble sort is very quickly and easily in polynomial time. And so sorting is a problem that's in P. When we get to higher, harder problems like optimization problems, where the game is we got some solution space of potential solutions and then we want to find the best solution or a really good solution it's very tempting to say, argue that oh well the space of solutions is really large and therefore it's hard and therefore i need meta heuristics or genetic algorithms or something like this this, this argument is very common, not at all right, and see an example of this, consider just sorting n numbers. A slightly different view on that would be, if you have n numbers, there's n factorial permutations, and you want to find the most sorted version, and if you do that counting argument, you go, oh well, if thousand numbers, thousand factorial is far too large to enumerate, therefore I can't possibly sort a thousand numbers. Of course, that's total nonsense. <clears throat> so it's not the case that a large search space is sufficient to argue that something's difficult. Now with sorting, that's fine. Uh, there is a more advanced, uh, more deceptive problem called the assignment problem. It's a very common standard uh, problem in many, many cases, uh, many applications. And it basically consists of assigning agents to tasks and just consider the very simple case where you have N agents, N tasks, and you've got to assign, do a one-to-one -one assignment then basically a solution is a permutation of the tasks. You put the N agents in a given order and you pick the N tasks in some order that you just then directly do the matching. First agent, first task. So the solution space is size N factorial. It looks hard. Uh, if N is a thousand, then a thousand factorial is far too far, far too many to enumerate them all. So it's very tempting to go, ah, well, we can't solve this, it's too hard. This is totally wrong because actually there's an algorithm, the Hungarian algorithm, that solves this problem exactly in polytime. So even though it looks like a difficult optimization problem, it's actually not, it's in P. It's not hard. The algorithm is quite sophisticated, but it's not hard in terms of requiring exponential run time. So we need something else. And the whole theory of NP is to give better justification for it's hard. And so we better use meta heuristics than just the it looks hard and the search space is large because that in itself is not enough. And how are we going to do that? We've seen P and sort of where's the NP going to come? And first thing to emphasize is the N of NP stands for non-determinism. <coughs> Standard theory introduces this whole non-determinism via something called determ non-deterministic Turing machines. Not going to do that, nowhere near enough time. So instead, just do it by introducing an example uh, but just before that got to quickly discuss a slight difference between optimization and decision problems a decision problem is something where there's simple yes no answer we just phrase things so give you a bunch of data you answer yes or no optimization is more find the minimum value of something so it's coming back with a number and these two are linked, but most of complexity theory is written in terms of decision problems. So it's important uh, to understand the difference. Otherwise, it can get confusing or even more confusing, depending on your point of view. Conversion between decision optimization is generally easy. You just do the pick some value of K, some parameter, and ask, yes, no, is there a solution that's better than K? 
if you get a yes, you reduce K. If not, you increase K and you do a sort of search on the values of K. So you can convert optimization to asking a sequence of yes, no questions. So the optimization versus decision isn't very uh, important at this stage at least. And so we do decision problems. And how do we phrase decision problems? We standardly write them in a standard format. Instance, which means the input data, and then you phrase a simple yes no question that an algorithm has to answer. And then the questions are about what's the complexity of algorithms to answer this question. As an example, consider well known traveling salesman problem, TSP. What data do you get? Well, you give you a graph and I give you a target distance as the decision version. I'll give you a target distance and then I'll just ask, is there a tour with all the vertices of all the vertices such that the tour length is no more than D? Decision version, yes, no. <clears throat> the, most of the sort of theory is written in terms of decision problems. Of course, the more natural one is the optimization version of asking what's the minimum tool length. And sometimes it's very uh, important to distinguish these statements about what exactly you mean by TSP is hard. <coughs> That's just a bit of context that uh, saying we're going to be doing decision problems. And the decision problem I like to use to introduce ideas is something called subset sum. And it's just a simple problem, deceptively simple, uh, actually quite hard uh, and has a lot of theory about it. But the statement of the problem is quite easy. I'll give you a set of numbers, integers, let's make them positive. I'll give you a target integer, K. And I ask you a yes no question. Is there a subset, let's call it T, of all the integers such that the elements of the subset add up to exactly K? It has to be precisely K. If it's at least K or at most K, it doesn't, it becomes far too easy. So it has to be precisely exactly K. How do we solve this? Well, what do we mean by solve? Well, there's two aspects of this. If I claim to have a solution, what's the complexity of verifying the solution? Or if I don't have a solution, what's the complexity of finding a solution? Or showing that there that, that none exist. And that's what I mean by solve subset sum. Well, Verifying a solution, if I have one or claim to have one, just go through, add them all up, big O of N polynomial, very fast. Can we solve subset sum? Well, yeah, very simple. Uh, just go through all possible subsets of the set of numbers. For every subset, compute the, the sum. If it equals K, we're done. Otherwise, return false, we didn't find a subset. This great, this works. Complexity is two to the N and much slower. As the usual emphasis, like two to the 300 is much larger than number of atoms in the universe. You can't do this for any sensible size. If you do really advanced algorithms, all they do is improve the exponent. So it might not be two to the N, it might be two to the N over 10. Then that's very important in practice because if you can improve the exponent, you can do uh, much larger sizes, but it's still exponential. So we have a very strong asymmetry between verifying and finding. And this is typical of optimization problems and a lot of theories to capture this idea. So how does it go about doing this? And a view on how to do this is consider the algorithm to solve subset sum, this algorithm, quote unquote algorithm, and it just goes through for every element. It either places the element in the set T or it doesn't place the element in the set T. And when it's finished, it checks if the sum equals K and if so returns yes, else returns no. So this 
calling this an algorithm you might complain about. It's not a proper algorithm because I never specified which option of either or to take. And in computer science, this is non just called non-deterministic algorithm. However, it does have the property that if the overall answer to the subset sum is yes, then some sequence of either or choices will output the yes. It will find the T and output yes. And in such a case, it only goes through N choices, so it runs in polynomial time. And understanding this uh, idea here is key to the idea of understanding what NP, this famous NP class actually means. So here we've got an algorithm that solves subsets on in polynomial time, but we had to use non-determinism. So we can define non-deterministic machines. These just mean that unlike standard programs, if you're in a particular state, what the program does next is not specified. It's partially specified, but not completely, or not necessarily completely. And it's important to note this is absolutely not the same as probabilistic. It's not that the next choice of action is 50-50 choice. It's just not specified. We have to get an answer from it though. And so the recipe in the theory is if we're running a non-deterministic machine, we have to get an answer from the whole thing. And the recipe is that if some sequence of non-deterministic choices gives a yes, then answer yes. Only answer no if all sequences give no. So it's very, very strongly asymmetric. Single yes outweighs any number of no's. Of course, we can't build this. Possibly the closest we get is quantum computers. They kind of do a bit like this. They do many things at the same time using quantum uh, superposition. However, weird as this is, the point is that the theory does actually capture nicely what's going on with practical issues of can we solve this problem or not? Quick recap, so you can view the execution of the non-deterministic machines like an X, uh, a tree starting on the left. Uh, we then have two choices. It takes one or the other, not a probability, it just takes one. And you do a sequence of those, one execution path leads to a yes, others lead to no. So this entire tree would count as uh, succeeding in one, two, three steps. Okay. What now do we do as a definition? Well, the key thing to remember is this here, that the definition of NP is that a problem is in this class NP, problem class, problem class meaning something like uh, timetabling or some optimization problem or sorting, or that's what I mean by a problem. And it's in NP if and only if there is some polytime algorithm, but you're allowed to use non-deterministic machine. So the structure is exactly the same. All you've added to the definition of P is that you're allowed to use non-determinism in your algorithms. And first thing to notice about this is it's actually a positive statement. It's very easy to think of NP as something negative. It's not. It's actually a positive statement that an algorithm exists. It's just that it's a non-deterministic algorithm. And uh, any specific problem will have some particular runtime. N time just means non-deterministic time. So might be non-deterministic machine that takes n squared time. And one way to think of non-determinism is essentially a sequence of good guesses or perfect guesses or as best you can possibly do guesses. You never make a mistake. 
And also we have this notion that verifying the guest solution is in P itself. So this is the definition of NP. One of the most important things to uh, emphasize is that NP does not stand for non-polynomial. It's very, very easy to accidentally say this. I'm sure I've said it accidentally, uh, but it makes nonsense of the theory because if NP really stood for non-polynomial, then P versus NP is asking, does non-polynomial equal non-polynomial? Well, by definition, they're not. So, and no one's going to give you a million dollar prize. So ask, it's like asking, are purple and not purple the same? Which is clearly nonsense. So thinking of NP stands for non-polynomial means the theory makes no sense. Instead, the N is for non-deterministic, think of magic guesses. So it's a positive statement. We can say, here's a non-deterministic algorithm that shows our problem is in NP. First result, well, P is a subset of P NP, and this just becomes from the definitions. The non-determinism isn't actually required. It's an option. So if you have a deterministic program that runs in polytime, it also counts as a non-deterministic program, and therefore it shows the problems in NP as well. So any problem in P is automatically in NP. It also allows you to quickly go, oh, well, this has problems obviously in P. So think of something like the decision problem for TSP. It's obviously in P, just non-deterministically pick a route and then checks it meets the tool length. So that's very quick, easy, shows the problems in NP. Two examples we need, would want to use. Other examples, number partition, very similar. I, I give you a set of numbers and then I ask, can you split it into two sets? Partition it, every number goes in S1 or S2, not both. And such that the sums are the same. Well, does this look easier or harder? Intuitively, I would have thought easier, maybe. Uh, it looks deceptively simple. It's actually one of the hardest problems I know. It's very easy to write down problems in this that are basically unsolvable with current technology. Another one is satisfiability. It's for more from logic, and it's basically writing down a propositional expression and then finding out, asking the question of, can we find a satisfying solution to this? Can I assign true or false to the X1s and X2s such that the answer is um, then true? The overall expression is true. It's a logical problem. Again, it looks a bit theoretical, but it's actually of high practical usage. Um, Intel use it, can use it for doing checking of uh, correctness of circuits. Google actually have a solver for optimization problems that converts things to SAT. What we have then is we got two sets, P, NP. We got things like shortest paths that are definitely in P, and then the subset sum, which is in, in NP, but we're not quite sure where. And what the happened with the theory in the 70s, there's a theory of NP completeness based on this that basically sets up things so that we can show bunches of problems are equally hard. If any of them are easy, they're all easy. If one of them's, if any of them are hard, actually truly hard, they're all hard. And this allows to link together different problems. The mechanism for doing this is something called reductions. So I reduce from problem X to Y. This sounds technical, but it's actually very straightforward. The details might be tricky, but the idea is very easy. I think of this as like given a library. Can I use the library function to so solve uh, something I want to solve? So if I want to solve something from class X and I have a solver for class Y, 
I'll convert my instances to instances of class Y and then solve them using that. So this is what reduction is. And do an example reducing from partition to subset sum. I want to convert partition into subset sum. And different way of writing this is think of this in code in general. Uh, so this is the reductions that you see all the time in discussions of NP hardness of a problem. And this is just conversion. I think of this as I write some code. It takes an input, the class I want to solve. It runs a conversion routine and returns the answer by feeding it to a solver for the other class. And we'll actually put a restriction that the conversion has to be poly time. So an example, converting subset sum, uh, reducing from partition to subset sum. And thinking in code wise, thinking of this as if I have a library function that solves subset sum, can I use it to implement partition, solver for partition? And yeah, this is actually very straightforward. Here's the code. Fine, we implement a solver for partition. Uh, add up all the numbers. If they're odd, I can't possibly divide it into two sets that add up to the same number, so I'll return false. Otherwise, I'll just use the subset sum to answer the question, can I find a subset that adds up to precisely half of the sum? So this is the reduction. What do we get from this? Well, it shows if subset sum is easy, by which I mean fast, poly time efficient, then partition is also efficient because the rest of the code is runs very fast. The bits of the code that it all it does is add up the sum and does a divide by two. That's polynomial, so it's fast. Taking it the opposite way around, take the negation of that statement, then it suggests if partition is not easy, then subset sum is not easy. Well, not easy is a bit vague, so we actually end up formalizing the not easy as NP hard. This is what the definition of NP hard is all about. It's a formalization of not easy, but without explicitly having to say that it's non-polynomial because we don't actually know it's non-polynomial. So what's the definition of NP hard? And this is the very deep, uh, deep insight that happened in the 70s, I guess, that of how do you define this? How do you set things up? And what you say is a problem's NP hard. So say a problem class Z, NP hard, if we can convert any problem that's in the class NP to an instance of Z, and solve it that way, then we'll say NP is hard. Is NP hard? Why does it mean this? Basically because if we can solve Z efficiently, then we can solve anything in NP. So Z is as bad as it gets in NP. It captures all of the bad bits of NP. If you happen to be able to solve Z in polytime, then you've just proved people's NP, collect your $1 million. How do we do this? Well, technic how do we ever prove something's NP hard? Uh, you've got to have some starting point. It's chains of reductions. And the first set step is the deep theorem in the 70s that proves SAT is NP hard. Exactly how doesn't matter. It's basically encoding. If it's in the problem class NP, there's a non-deterministic program, which we do a Turing machine, but that's technical detail. And that can be converted to asking, does some big propositional formula have a satisfying assignment? So that shows SAT is NP hard. After that, you do this reductions chaining together so you get everything in NP converts is reduces to some problem class which then can all be converted to some other problem class 
And then you get the reasoning that, oh, this allows us to show the second problem class, the MPC2 is MP hard. So the reasoning is this, any problem in NP solved by conversion to some instance of MPC1. If you can do MPC1, you can convert it to MPC2, and then you just chain things together. So the reductions is nothing more than just chaining together uh, in order to do something that's very similar to what you do in proof by induction. You have a base case and step cases. Um, this slide just says it obviously way around. Uh, the big thing to watch for is if you think of doing those chains and you do one of them back to front, you've got nothing. You prove nothing and it's very tempting to do reductions back to front and they show nothing. The result might be true, but the argument is wrong and this can easily happen. So this is something to watch out for if ever trying to do uh, arguments about why my optimization problem is NP hard. So what did we get from that? Well, what that converts to is that the reduction, that little tiny piece of code shows that if partitions NP hard, then subset sums NP hard. So this is how we can build things together. OK, so that's given NP hard. What next? Well, NP hard problems don't necessarily have to be in NP. So you invent a new phrase for something that's in NP and also NP hard and call it NP complete. And that's usually what you meet. But NP hard and NP complete are not exactly the same thing. You have to watch out a bit sometimes. Um, OK. Natural question is, can we do the other way around? Yes, the other reduction the other way around. And basically what this ends up showing is that partition and subset sum are both NP complete. And so there's a sense in which they're equally hard. If you can solve either in polytime, you can solve the other in polytime. So summary of P versus NP. Many practical optimization problems are MP complete or their decision version is MP complete to be more exact. Uh, no one's proved you can't find a polytime algorithm for an MP complete problem. Uh, it would be major news if they did and it's many, not all, expect that it doesn't exist. Uh, the protection from being sacked is if you're given a problem that's MP hard, you're protected from someone sacking you because you haven't found a polytime algorithm. Okay, so essence of NP complete problems that are guess and verify. Verification fast. Guess is non-determinism in theory. In practice, the guess is heuristics. So this is the link between the theory and the practice is that we try to emulate the non-determinism as best we can use in heuristics. OK, so that's P versus NP. Uh, and our time to just quickly nip through the no free lunch theorem. Um, we are 15 minutes over. Uh, we have 90 minutes, right? So yeah. well, I'll just skip through very briefly and uh, black box versus white box optimization. And there's something you may see called no free lunch theorem. Uh, it's very common misconceptions about it, and it's very easy to write down. And I've seen it in draft PhD dissertations, things that essentially would say P not equal MP, but NFLT does not prove that. So what's going on is this is really just a warning, be very careful. Uh, but the thing that's of practical use is this, that there's something called black box optimization. It's a classification of algorithms and a black box optimizer is something where given a tentative solution X, all you get is the fitness or the quality or the cost. And you don't have access to or cannot use the internals of that computation. And this is actually very common especially optimization problems, just the internal of the computation of the fitness is might not be accessible at all or certainly not usable. 
Examples of algorithms that do this are black genetic algorithms, simulated annealing. They don't use the internal structure as a fitness function at all. ICE compares with white box where you do have access to everything. Many algorithms also do this. Typical integer programming, you are given, or the integer programming systems, given the entire problem and can and does exploit the internal structure. No free lunch theorem, famous uh, theorem, over 10K citations, very well known in the optimization community, gets paraphrased as, if you average over all functions and all algorithms perform equally, it's often misused, often to justify my algorithm didn't perform very well, but that's okay because when I average, they all perform the same. And that's just wrong. Why it's wrong is in the actual theorem, the algorithm, when they say algorithm, they actually mean black box algorithm. So an algorithm just picks a sequence of values and does nothing else. It has no internal insight in the problem. Also, overall functions really does mean overall possible fitness functions, not just the ones you would get from any sensible uh, formulation, in which case the theory is obvious, because if you average overall functions, the values at two different points are entirely uncorrelated. So doing things in a particular order is no difference from any other. So that really does make it obvious that all algorithms are equal. And people miss these things out and tend to say things like, um, all algorithms perform equally well on the TSP, which is obviously wrong because direct search is exponential. And if they all prefer, provide were the same, you just prove P is not equal to NP. And that's unknown. So that clearly cannot be the correct interpretation. So summary, black summary, white box, black box, vital part of understanding differences. And don't use misuse and no free lunch theorem. So I'll stop there. I didn't see any questions, so I'll hand over to Ender. Um, here we go. So this is the second part of the of our talk on optimization approaches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover hyperheuristics and uh, metaheuristics in this uh, part. Uh, but I would like to start, you know, with the basics first. Um, again, just as a reminder, I'm going to cover all these concepts from a computer science point of view. It's all about designing search algorithms, optimization approaches. So we all know there are many different optimization problems that appear in various forms across industry, leisure and public sectors. And uh, uh, the majority of those problems are, uh, thanks to Andrew, hopefully, you understand now what that means, but uh, they are computationally difficult to solve problems. They are all in the MP hard uh, set. So uh, in order to solve an optimization problem, what we do is first determine the target quantity, typically a function of variables and you know uh, what we call objective function to be maximized or minimized, uh, which might be subject to one or more constraints. And uh, in that representation, the next step uh, uh, while you design your search algorithm, uh, well, you can choose one. That's black box optimization, right? You can just use one of those approaches if it's appropriate for your problem, or you design a search method from scratch to solve the optimization problem. And that uh, search method will be searching the space of solutions uh, to detect the best or the optimal solution at the end, right? And um, the variables, could be discrete or they could be continuous. So there are different uh, sets of search algorithms for each case. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to focus on the discrete search spaces. Uh, again, this is somewhat, uh, uh, let's say, starting from a really simple case of what do you mean by search for an optimal solution? So uh, imagine that you are kind of lost 
and uh, for some reason you really need to find the let's say highest peak uh, in the environment so this is really a landscape it's a nice one by the way so how can you find the highest peak so what you do is of course by looking around that's fine but are we sure that that's the highest peak just pointed by the arrow we can formulate this as if a maximization problem and this is like a Two, well, it's three dimensional, but let's assume it's a 2D uh, uh, space, and we want to find the highest peak around this for, for a given environment. So how can we do that? Well, you can just basically try to go to the highest peak closest to you and look around, and then if there's another higher peak, you just go towards that, and that's how you design a search algorithm. But then again, just remember, the range that you are looking for is important because Behind that mountain, there might be another actually a region where the highest peak uh, might be actually located at. So uh, now imagine you're blind. So how can you find that highest peak? So in search and optimization, uh, when we uh, look at different problems, so this is a simple problem of RNA sequencing. There are three nucleotides and uh, what we are looking at is the assignments for each one of those. Right, and uh, the search space is somewhat limited, so we can visualize the whole search space for this specific problem instance. And it's, it's, it's uh, as you can see, it's here. So in here, uh, uh, this kind of shows actually the minimum, let's say, uh, in here, where we want to minimize, for example, this value, let's say, and this is actually the optimal result. It's kind of obvious, it's kind of nice to have a look at, to visualize it. But if you go to a slightly different problem domain, uh, these are called local optima networks. Uh, this just uh, is a visualization for the permutation flow shop scheduling problem, where there are only 10 jobs and seven machines to process those jobs. Uh, and interestingly, uh, these, uh, uh, let's say, spheres represent equivalent solutions. So there might be multiple solutions with the same objective values. That's a possibility for all the problems that might happen. But this is kind of visualizing this in using local uh, Optima networks. Uh, it just gives you an idea just for this problem instance. Just notice, not the problem domain, but just for this problem instance, this uh, red sphere represents the optimal solutions. And there are multiple optimal solutions. And the search algorithms are supposed to somehow traverse this whole search space and find the optimal solution. And if you take a traveling salesman problem, again, this is a well-known problem, uh, as you can see how complicated uh, the search landscape can get, right? So, uh, that's what we mean by search for optimi optimal uh, solution. So optimization search methods can be broadly classified as exact or exhaustive methods like dynamic programming, branch and bound, or constraint satisfaction, uh, on inexact approximate methods like heuristics, metaheuristics, and hyperheuristics. And that's, again, what I'm going to focus on. So uh, what the state of the art methods that say in this area uh, for solving discrete optimization problems. Heuristic optimization, this is the basic definition. A heuristic is a rule of thumb method derived from human intu intuition. So given a problem, uh, that's kind of the simplest approach that a, a human can come up with. Uh, generally, these are really human designed, not uh, designed by the computers automatically because there are such methods as well. So a heuristic is a search method which seeks good or near optimal solutions at a reasonable cost without being able to guarantee optimality, right? So when you design a heuristic search algorithm, there are certain paradigms uh, and you can uh, design your algorithms based on those search paradigms. So there are single point or trajectory based search methods, or uh, you can design your algorithm to be a multi-point based search method which means that you can use one active solution to perform search over the search landscape, or you can use multiple solutions, multiple interacting solutions to detect the optimal solution uh, in that uh, search space. 
And there are constructive approaches, which means that uh, as you perform search, you construct uh, solutions starting from scratch towards a complete solution. Uh, so this is like a traveling salesman problem, uh, you know, a, a, a instance where we have four cities. Our goal is to visit each city for once and come back to the starting city. Uh, and, and the goal is, or the objective is, to reduce the traveling distance, right? So what you can do is you can randomly pick a city and then uh, select another city which is closest to it. So in here, it starts with the second city looks to the closest city and in here it's one because it's closer to than the other ones and so on. So you can build a complete solution uh, uh, starting from scratch and building, uh, constructing a can, uh, solution towards the complete solution. Or you can design perturbative heuristics or algorithms, uh, which means that you come up with a method uh, which processes complete solutions and you can move from one complete solution to another. So in here, for example, what we are using is what is called neighborhood operator. We pick out two items and swap them. So this could be your neighborhood operator, perturbation operator, and uh, you can just uh, apply that uh, uh, for a certain number of iterations and try to improve the objective values traveling distance, right? Reduce it if possible. If the traveling uh, distance reduces, you keep that uh, solution. Otherwise, you just uh, pick, a, pick another two, uh, let's say, neighboring solutions and continue with the uh, swaps. And when we look at the mutation operators, there are two types, muta sorry, uh, uh, perturbative operators. There are two types, mutational and heat climbing operators or heuristics. So mutational ones, basically you have a candidate solution uh, and uh, uh, the output of the mutational heuristic is uh, it could be anything basically. It could be improving or it might be a worsening solution. But as for hill climbing methods, uh, the quality of the input solution is important. That solution gets processed and the output has to be either uh, with the same objective value, result with the same objective value, or uh, it should improve it. So that's the only difference. Okay, so what is a meta heuristic? A meta heuristic is a high level problem independent algorithmic framework that provides a set of guidelines um, or strategies to develop heuristic optimization algorithms. So this is a recent uh, definition provided by Sorensen and Glover. They are very well known uh, uh, colleagues uh, doing research in the meta heuristics field. Um, and uh, today's, let's say, some well known algorithms are basically uh, invented by Glover, like Taboo Search. So uh, I'm saying this is a recent description because before the description was not this general, but now we have this general description. Uh, and I'm going to explain what I mean in a bit. Uh, so, let's say that you want to design a meta heuristic approach to a, a problem. So, how can you how can you develop such a meta heuristic solution uh, to a given problem? So, these are the major components that you have to design. Representation: you have to come up with an encoding candidate solution, and as I said, you know you have to design an evaluation function or objective function. You have to design an initialization method uh, and then you have to have some sort of a guideline. Each meta heuristic has a different guideline, but you have to come up with one and you know use it uh, in your approach. And then you need to come up with uh, relevant neighborhood relations based on the guideline or operators. Uh, and generally all the meta heuristics, they have some sort of mechanism for escaping from local optimum. And the well-known approach is, of course, genetic algorithms, so I'm going to use it as an example. But uh, uh, first, let's take uh, the timetabling problem as an example, because everyone can relate to this. And, you know, uh, all the universities, uh, they have this issue every year. They have to uh, arrange exams. So we know the uh, durations of each exam. And, of course, the question becomes, uh, how can we design or how can we get a timetable 
based on the requirements of the university and considering that students are taking multiple exams and they should not overlap and there are such constraints. So how can we do it, uh, uh, solve this problem? And this is an MP-hard problem as well. And uh, in general, I think we tested this. Uh, the uh, largest problem that we can solve, uh, real world problem that we can solve using an exact solver consists of about uh, 30 exams. It's kind of shocking. That's what we have experienced. So for that reason, we have to design uh, heuristic optimization methods. And let's assume that we are going to design an algorithm for solving this problem. Well, you have to go through all these steps. And then let's say that for the guideline search process, we have chosen genetic algorithms. And genetic algorithms, they do have their own mechanism for escaping from local optima. So since we, we have chosen that algorithm, we are not done yet. Uh, let's say that we decided on the representation, we have, uh, we have to design the initialization method. So genetic algorithm is a multi-point based search method, meaning that it just performs the search using multiple solutions, multiple interacting solutions, uh, and it has these components, highlighted components, like in here, choosing individuals for recombination, or crossover operator, mutation operator, hill climbing old operator. And hill climbing is added in here, this is a memetic algorithm, so it's a variant of an evolutionary algorithm, where we have hill climbing, but we don't have to have this one. Let's skip it for the time being. Uh, and when you look at these red ones, these are the parameters, right? And this is called crossover probability, and this is called mutation probability. Generally, uh, if you are using a, you know, uh, uh, for example, MATLAB, you just, uh, you know, use the existing library. And generally, again, researchers do not pay much attention what type of crossover or mutation operators are used in the background. There are many, many uh, operators for uh, different representations. Uh, but these are the components that you have to design, and these are the components that you have to pick uh, if you are just using an existing library. And once you create, uh, put all these together, uh, you have to implement them, or as I said, you have to choose from the library, put them together, now you are good to go. You can apply this algorithm uh, to a given problem instance. So there are many different meta heuristics, uh, guides or guidelines that say that you can make use of. Uh, uh, and uh, Sorensen and uh, Glover uh, classified them into three groups. Local search methods. These are trajectory single point based search methods and they are perturbative. We have population based methods Again, these are perturbative methods and uh, they use multiple uh, solutions for the search. And we have constructive uh, meta heuristics. So they construct or reconstruct and they destroy the variable assignments and reconstruct them through their, uh, uh, let's say, systematic way. Uh, and they uh, build towards a complete solution. So there are three groups of meta heuristics. Um, and when you look at those meta heuristics, these are, by the way, very well known ones like simulated annealing, taboo search, or genetic algorithms, memetic algorithms. These are very well known approaches. There are so many right now, uh, and I'll come back to that point again, but I just wanted to point out one thing. When you look at each one of these algorithms, they come with certain parameters. For example, simulated annealing, there is an initial temperature and there is the cooling schedule, uh, which introduces a, 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 a parameter called cooling rate. And taboo search, if we are using the original algorithm, there is a taboo list and uh, that list size needs to be fixed, so which is called tenue. And uh, in genetic uh, algorithms or evolution algorithms, there is the population size, mutation probability. If you are using crossover, there's the crossover probability and so on. So all of them has these parameters. And it is a well-known fact that the performance of a meta heuristic is sensitive to those parameter settings. But uh, uh, I think this is the right time to emphasize this. There is a growing number of uh, meta heuristics out there. And these algorithms are again implemented in, meta uh, in MATLAB, that sort of libraries 
for uh, the ease of use. But unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, these growing algorithms generally uh, is just a variant of an existing algorithm. Although there are so many references or citations, they receive a lot of citations. Most of them, they do not make sense. They, and they are all presented as if these are new algorithms, but it turns out that most of them are existing algorithms. So uh, uh, there is an over reliance on you know, uh, reasoning by metaphor that hides commonalities between algorithms, leading to the repeated discovery of the same ideas and heuristics and a widespread duplication of research effort. So that I just listed a few papers in here. You can, you know, the first one is, you know, again, Sorensen's paper, Meta Heuristics to Metaphor Exposed. So you can have a look at these papers. They point out some of those algorithms, subset of those new algorithms, which are not, in fact, uh, are new algorithms. They are just variants of existing algorithms. Uh, uh, but here we are. So uh, you should be very careful in choosing metaheuristic algorithm for solving your uh, uh, problem. Uh, and you should really, let's say, give the credit to the right algorithm in that sense. Right, so coming back to the parameter setting issue, uh, there are two approaches uh, to uh, for parameter setting. Uh, it's, it's called tuning, parameter tuning versus parameter control. So for the timetabling problem, let's say that you have designed your algorithm, right? Uh, uh, and uh, you implemented your algorithm. You think that you are done. Now you can apply it directly to a given problem instance. That's what I've said initially, right? Well, that's not exactly true because now uh, another time consuming part starts in your, uh, for your implementation, which is the parameter tuning. As I said, it's a, a commonly known fact that all the meta heuristics are sensitive to their parameter settings. So what you need to do is, for example, in this evolution algorithms or genetic algorithms, we have crossover probability and mutation probability. If we ignore the population size, uh, uh, you really need to set these parameter values somehow. And that can be done through tuning. There are different approaches to tuning, which I'm not going to go into, but you have to at least try, try out some, uh, let's say, discrete choices uh, in a factorial manner and see what happens uh, in order to find the best settings or uh, best settings for the combination of probability of crossover and mutation probability together. Uh, and uh, there is the parameter control one. So parameter tuning happens before you apply your algorithm uh, to the problem instances that you have. So you can select a subset of problem instances and on those instances, you can uh, uh, utilize a, a design of experiments method and decide the best parameter setting combination for your algorithm. That's perfectly fine. Then you can apply your algorithm to the unseen instances with those parameter settings. Parameter control has a different, uh, you know, uh, provides a different idea. So uh, this is like, why do we need to lose time with the tuning? We should just uh, uh, embed some sort of a learning method into our approach. And our approach uh, do, does the parameter setting in time as it performs the search. So that uh, there are such mechanisms as well. Uh, and that's also, uh, if you ask whether which one is the best tuning or control, unfortunately, there is no uh, straightforward answer to that. It all depends on the problem domain and the mechanisms that you have. Uh, the aim with the parameter control is uh, to somehow get rid of the need for parameter tuning in that sense. Right, so some observations from scientific literature, because people have been designing uh, meta heuristic algorithms uh, for a long while now to their uh, complex real world problems, one of them being vehicle routing. So we see this quite often. So as you can see, uh, they have uh, certain instances and they have this many parameters, so many, uh, and they just try to find the optimal setting in that sense. So we see that. And when you look at actually different configurations, you can see they have different performances. In here, 
assume that this average cap uh, column shows you the performance of different configurations uh, and uh, lower the bed, right? So then you can detect some, you know, uh, which components you need to use in your algorithm, also what their parametric settings should be. And we see that, you know, in many cases, this is just an example in vehicle routing. And in timetabling, I would like to point out another, uh, let's say, issue. Uh, so these are instances from different universities. Again, these are some performance indicators of different algorithms. Each column it represents a different algorithm. And when you look at it, you can see that actually for each problem uh, instance, you might get a different algorithm performing the best, right? Why is this an issue? Well, so we don't have a single algorithm which performs the best on all the problem instances that we have. That, that's the point, right? So the state of the art in optimization is this is the current state of the art in optimization, and they tend to focus on bespoke systems. So in general, these systems are expensive to build, but provide successful results. But unfortunately, their application to new problem domains or even new problem instances from a known domain still requires expert in, in, in involvement. So can we somehow get rid of that? So this is the motivation for hyperheuristic research. So hyperheuristic is a search method or learning mechanism for selecting or generating heuristics to solve computationally difficult problems. Uh, so what I like about hyperheuristics is they uh, provide a framework uh, where you can uh, design, it's like a component-based approach. You can have reusable components for cross-domain search. In other words, you can use the same, uh, those components as you solve another problem uh, regardless of the problem domain you are dealing with, those components stay. Uh, so, the research into hyperistics is motivated by raising the level of generality. We ask the question, what are the limits? So, the grand challenge is uh, we have specific solvers, solvers for problem A, B, C separately. So, for example, gen genetic algorithm could solve uh, uh, problem A uh, and its performance could be better than simulated annealing, but in domain B, uh, in problem domain B, you might have simulated annealing performing better than any other approach. And in problem domain C, you might have end colony optimization performing better than the other approach. So we have problem specific solvers, but the question is, can we somehow develop a solution method uh, which is more general, right? So uh, the, of course, the holy grail is uh, can we create a general sorrow, which doesn't exist. However, there's a significant scope for future research in between. So uh, I always get this question. So what is the difference between meta heuristics and hyper heuristics? They are different search spaces. So standard heuristics or meta heuristics, they operate upon potential solutions, but hyper heuristic operates upon low level heuristics, which operate on potential solutions. So there's a level of indirection and uh, there's a division of labor. Hyperistic controls the low level heuristics which perform search over the uh, space of potential solutions. And yes, meta a hyperistic could be a meta heuristic or low level heuristics could be meta heuristics. Um, I just wanted to show this slide for a simple reason. This idea is not new. So this idea was around uh, in 1960s, but they didn't name it a hyperheuristic. I think the first paper appearing uh, with the uh, uh, name hyperheuristic was by Denzinger et al. in 1997, but this research field kind of picked up uh, pace uh, starting from 2001 with uh, the Calding paper. So the idea is, Pretty simple, as I said. Uh, you know, uh, just this is a example hyperistic framework. I'll just go back and show you this. So this is kind of an interesting paper because in this paper the authors propose that uh, in order to have some sort of reusable mechanisms and apply it to different problem domains, we need a separation between the problem domain implementation and the control mechanism. 
So they proposed this type of a framework. So hyperheuristic just uh, has access to problem domain independent uh, information and uh, using that information, it just maintains some internal structures uh, and makes use of the information it gathers during the search process. And all the communication between hyperheuristic level and the problem domain is through this uh, entity, which is called domain barrier. And at the low level, there is the problem domain implementation. So this is like representation, evaluation function, initial solutions, all that bunch. And the low level heuristics, it assumes that they are already all implemented, right? And there are different types of uh, hyperheuristics, online learning hyperheuristics, offline learning and no learning one. Um, and uh, there are heuristic selection method methodologies uh, and there are heuristic generation method methodologies. So uh, I'm going to just focus on the heuristic selection methodologies that is selection hyperheuristics using perturbative heuristics. And when we look at the framework and the scientific literature, we just notice one thing. I mean, this is uh, kind of uh, uh, because of the component design of hyperheuristics, it has two, the selection hyperheuristics have two components. Um, in general, first of all, they are single point based search methods. Either they have a heuristic selection method and they have a move acceptance uh, method. And this is the algorithm. It's a very straightforward algorithm. So you start with an initial candidate solution and uh, until the termination criteria uh, uh, is satisfied, you perform this loop. You select a heuristic using a, a method. That's the heuristic selection method and apply it to the current solution. And, and then you generate a new solution, decide whether to accept that new solution or not. If the new solution is accepted, you use that solution and continue with your iteration. That's all. It's a very simple framework. So the question is, can you somehow find a library and download and you start, you know, implementing hyperistics? And this is kind of interesting, but yes, uh, because our research group implemented an API. Uh, they designed an API and implemented it in Java. So there are six problem domains. And all those low level heuristics, problem domain uh, 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 related components are all implemented. What is missing is the hyper heuristics, right? So, for example, if you look at pin packing, and here uh, we have different types of heuristics like mutational, ruin and recreate, hill climbing, or crossover heuristics. So, this XO means there is one crossover operator, and we have mutation operators, uh, we have three mutation operators and we have ruin and recreate operators. So the hyperistic layer doesn't know actually uh, which uh, low level heuristic operator is what uh, heuristic. Um, and beam packing, we have eight low level heuristics implemented. So computer scientists like to count from starting from zero. Right, so then uh, our research group organized a competition so uh, this competition uh, provided four public domains and introduced two hidden domains. So for each domain, there were five test instances. All the algorithms were tested on those five instances. So in total, we had 30 uh, test instances. And for each instance, the median, uh, they, all the algorithms are run for 31 times and the median results are compared. So, in hyperistic research, our aim is not to find the best solver for all the instances because we have different domains. Our goal is to find uh, the best approach uh, uh, which performs the best on average across all the domains. Uh, and after ranking, they just gave a score. Uh, the first ranking algorithm got a score of 10. Since we have 30 instances, the top score would be 300. And the uh, uh, competition resulted, resulted with we know the adap HH algorithm. It's an interesting algorithm. Uh, uh, but now let's have a look into uh, what we mean by heuristic selection. And these are some of the uh, papers I have listed in here, uh, which pro propose these simple approaches uh, for heuristic selection. Okay, so simple random, as the name suggests, you just 
choose one of the low level heuristics at random. And random permutation also interesting. What you do is you form a circular queue from the heuristics by randomly sequencing them. So at each step, you choose the one uh, uh, in the queue, at the, in the, let's say, head of the queue and apply it. And in the next step, you choose the other one. It's still random. There is no learning involved. But then we have random gradient approach, which I would say has the shortest uh, memory. That is, you choose a heuristic randomly, you apply it. Uh, if it receives, if, if, if the new solution uh, improves the uh, previous solution, then you accept that. And so on. So this is kind of, uh, 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 there is a bit of learning, but it's very limited and it uses the shortest memory in that sense. One of the most, uh, let's say, successful approaches in heuristic selection is choice function. So uh, it just maintains three quantities. Uh, it just maintains the individual perform. It maintains a utility score for each low level heuristic considering their individual performance. And then it maintains uh, another, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 data structure that is how well it is performed with uh, other heuristics. Then there's this third component for diversification. It just measures the elapsed time since the heuristic has been called. So these uh, uh, values are positive uh, first and second. So in time, those values will increase, but somehow we would like to have a, a heuristic which is not used also to have a chance to be selected. So hence uh, we have this third criterion. And it just, uh, the system uses weighted average of all those three scores, right? Then uh, at each step, we need to choose one of the heuristics. In here we have six heuristics, right? Choice function chooses the one with the maximum score. That's how it operates. So uh, if you look at the move acceptance components, there are so many of them. And uh, researchers have been studying uh, different types of uh, uh, move acceptance methods. Uh, and it looks like uh, the uh, methods which are adaptive are more successful than the other, other ones within the framework of uh, uh, hyperheuristics. This is just to point out a fact. Um, this is from uh, our recent survey on uh, selection hyperheuristics. And these are the most popular domains and some selected references are there. So there are certain design problems uh, and dynamic environment problems. Then we have knapsack problems, maximum satisfiability, puzzle and games, scheduling and so on. Just notice one thing. Um, the only engineering problems that we have in here is software engineering problems, right? So focus of recent studies on selection hyperistics are these three items, I should say. So either the new studies, uh, they make use of existing hyperistics or meta heuristics for cross domain search and they tune it uh, uh, for performance improvement. Or what they do is uh, researchers basically, uh, they use the existing hyperistics and apply it to new problem domains or new hyperistics are created and tested. So uh, when we say hyperistics are controlling low level heuristics, another idea is hyperheuristics controlling hyperheuristics. So there is another level of in, in direction again on top of it, then in here I just called it hypersquare heuristics and based on meta heuristics and data science techniques are emerging as well. So there are multi-stage approaches or generation methods based on machine learning or genetic programming. And there are uh, new hyperheuristics uh, which are used for multi-objective optimization. And also hybrid approaches are ap appearing, that is uh, combining exact and inexact approaches. These are generally referred to as math heuristics, which I'm not going to go into. Okay, so I would like to make uh, pro uh, provide you some case, uh, case studies that we have done. And these are interesting case studies. Uh, so uh, HyFlex provides a nice benchmarking tool. 
So uh, in, uh, for the competition, chess competition, there were about 20 approaches competing. Uh, and uh, we implemented a steady state memetic algorithm, very standard algorithm, right? And we tested on all these uh, six different problem domains and compared its performance against the uh, uh, competing algorithms, right? And uh, it, it performed poorly, but it was still better than some of the hyperheuristics proposed at the time. However, just notice this one. So what we did is we just applied parameter tuning, okay? And we applied parameter tuning and uh, we've got incredible improvement in the, in, in the performance of uh, the standard memetic algorithm. This is really just to illustrate how much improvement you can get. It, it, it's incredible. It's, uh, the standard algorithm just through parameter tuning uh, can rank the four, right? So you don't have to even think about how to design an algorithm. You can just basically apply one, right? But still, Adopt HH ranked the first, okay? So this is another example uh, of a reconfigured algorithm. So this is like, again, we used uh, Highflex and Chesk uh, uh, as a benchmark. So this is the generic uh, choice function result that's actually uh, without combining any uh, move acceptance method. We applied choice function and we accepted whatever the solution is generated. But what we, do is, uh, what we did is we just ignored crossover operator in the low level heuristic set. And just making a modification in the parameter of this uh, approach, we've got improvement, right? Then we wanted to see what would happen if we include crossover operators in all the domains, and that also made an uh, uh, improvement as well. So using all the operators, and modifying the parameter setting, again, we've got a, an incredible improvement. Right, so uh, after the competition, chess competition, uh, for a long while, uh, uh, the IDAP HH algorithm uh, continued to be the top ranking approach in the area. So what we did is we developed a, a different multi-stage approach. And that approach, uh, was kind of, uh, uh, I should, I would say it's a simple approach. So we select a low level heuristic based on their scores. So we have a scoring function. I'm going to show you how we did that. But uh, uh, in here, this is also called softmax. We add up all the scores of the heuristics and each low level heuristic uh, is selected based on the probability of uh, their scores over the total score, right? So that, that's what we did for selecting a, a low-level heuristic. How we computed scores is a different one. So we paired up all the existing single low-level heuristics. So imagine in, in this example, we have uh, 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 two low-level heuristics, right? And then we paired them up and created four more low-level heuristics. So if we have n heuristics, now we end up with n plus n squared heuristics. In here, in this very simple example, six. And then we applied uh, uh, all these heuristics are applied to a given uh, instance or cur current, uh, let's say, solution, which generated multiple solutions. And uh, uh, we repeated this process for a certain number of steps. And every time we have, we ended up with new solutions, right? Uh, then we looked at the solutions uh, from a different perspective. So at each phase, right, we have a solution and we can plot the objective value versus this is like the time it uh, get, uh, time that we spend to achieve these values, right? Uh, and there's a trade-off. What we want is somehow to make use of heuristics, which makes improvement or small improvement in short time and they would be equivalent to other heuristics, which, would which we would like to make use of, which makes large improvement uh, taking longer time. So that's why we use this multi-objective trade-off concept and designed our uh, uh, heuristic method. And the nice thing is, when you consider those cases, 
Uh, we know which low level heuristics generated those trade off solutions, then we count them. And that count forms the score for each low level heuristic, which we make use of in stage number one. So this hyper heuristic basically increases the number of low level heuristics and then reduces it. And that performed, the, uh, this is one of the top ranking hyperistics now uh, out there. So I would like to just uh, show you, this is uh, just one slide, uh, two slides, uh, but uh, to show you another interesting idea because no one has used this before. Uh, the idea in here is to observe uh, a hyper heuristic in operation, how it selects a low level heuristic and whether it accepts or rejects a, a newly generated solution and learn from it through machine learning and then create those uh, uh, components, put them together, uh, yielding a new hyper heuristic. So that's kind of comes from robotics area, this idea. It's called apprenticeship learning. So generally there is the human expert, it just makes some moves and the robot learns actually to perform tasks from the expert. So it's, it's a very similar idea. So we want to learn from uh, a hyper heuristic how to make certain decisions like you know heuristic selection and move acceptance. The, uh, and uh, in theory, in robotics area, it turns out that robot could perform the tax, uh, tasks much better than uh, 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 the human expert if that happens. And that's what we were hoping to. So we use a modified choice function and accept all as the expert and we applied it to open vehicle routing problem. The point of the matter is, uh, this is just, you really don't need to understand all this, but all I can say is uh, at the end, uh, we have evidence that this approach works. So instead of uh, just using a hyper heuristic, we can observe its behavior and ignore its poor, let's say, uh, behavior during the search process and machine learning can uh, produce a new hyper heuristic which performs better than the expert. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm over four minutes, I think, but I'll just uh, do the conclusions. So hyper heuristics with reusable components are general purpose, effective intelligent search methods and along with meta heuristics, they have been applied successfully to various computationally hard real world problems. Uh, but uh, again, just to highlight, not that many applications of hyperistics in optimization of multifunctional composite structures. Uh, and uh, Vivek has been actually doing some experimentation, so he's going to make the presentation. I didn't even go into that, so. Um, the HyperDex framework has been in use for hyperistic research and benchmarking purposes for a decade now, and such frameworks support researchers and practitioners to be able to put search methods on a much more experimentally rigorous footing to advance the science of search methods and uh, to build a communal resource that is the benefit of for both practitioners and researchers in this important area of computational intelligence. Now imagine that we are kind of using the benchmark to find out which hyperistic performs the best. And if you have the relevant API and if you use that in your own implementation for the problem you are dealing with, then uh, what happens is if there is a better performing hyperistic, all you do is download it and basically uh, use it in your system. So conclusions, uh, let's continue with these. So the standard model of using hyperistics that is one off with uh, opaque domain barrier and no learning between instances can be greatly extended without loss of domain independence. And the need for more flexible modular tools with reusable components capable of operating in information rich environments and so standardization is growing. There are many, many papers now on these issues. And through the component based design of search methods, they can be described from a behavioral standpoint and moving away from the over reliance on metaphor and the accidental reinvention of established heuristics. And thanks. <laughs>